Thank you, Pastor Bill, and thank you, Church. It's great to be uh, with family, and I bring greetings from CFC South, and I bring greetings from my wife in the front row. She's less far away than the rest of the church at the moment, and it's just a joy to be here. We haven't um, been to a service here, I think, in a couple of years. Um, I preached here during the lockdown um, for an online service, I think was the last time I've been here, and we are recipients of being sent out by a generous, uh, healthy, loving church family. And if I can commend the leadership team of this local church to you, um, the leadership team are all friends of mine who I love deeply, but I just, I trust them all so much. And the thing I love about the leadership of this local church is that they're honestly about building Jesus' kingdom, not their own. They, they are honestly about um, seeing Jesus kingdom of love and justice and mercy spread not just in the western suburbs of Adelaide but throughout our city and throughout the world and so whether it's Alice Springs or whether it's in the southern suburbs of Adelaide um, we are recipients of the generosity of this church this church that has planted um, around 30 churches in its history it's a great heritage that you're all part of and um, yeah so thank you so much even last week we did our first healing clinic as a local church and so we were feeling a little bit um, just inexperienced and ill-equipped for something we hadn't done before. So I got on the phone to Pastor uh, Phil and Janet Bryce and I said, could you guys come down on a Sunday night and help us out with our first healing clinic? And they're like, we'd love to be there. And I just think that spirit of generosity and loving God, loving people and not trying to build for themselves is just such a, a beautiful thing. And um, so thank you. Thank you for um, not just the leadership team, but thank you for everyone that's part of this church family in releasing this church to be all that she is called to be. And I believe that the best is ahead. Do you believe that? Can I invite you, if you're able, to stand to your feet for the reading of the scriptures? Psalm 116. I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangle me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. In my alarm, I said, everyone's a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all His people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His faithful saints. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering for you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all His people in the courts of the house of the Lord in your midst, Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. This is God's Word to us today. And all God's people said, Amen. do you want to take your seats? I think this, this ancient song that we're gonna be unpacking is a, it presents a radical picture of the human person and a radical picture of the God of Israel, the Christian God. This picture is, and, and there is a radical interconnectedness between the picture of God, is, who God is and who we are as people. I believe that everyone in this room and everyone watching online and every human being will one day have to grapple with 
the great questions of life, the great existential questions of life is, who am I, where do I come from? Who is God? Where am I going? Is there a meaning for my life? Is there purpose to my life? What do I really believe? Not just what is socially acceptable, not just what is popular, but what do I believe at my core and what am I gonna give my life for? Because guess what? Everyone in this room is gonna give their life for something. Everyone in this, in this room is gonna give their life for something. And it doesn't matter if you, even if you just live your life being ambivalent or being agnostic or saying, I don't know, you are living your life with your quest, to your question or your agnosticism. If you invest your, if you just float through life and you just live a life of convenience, you are investing your life into convenience. If you invest your life into fear and dread and caution, you are investing your life into fear and dread and caution. Everyone has one life to live and an unexamined faith is a vulnerable faith. There is a time coming where what you really believe will be tested and we as a society, we as the church in the West, the Christian Family Centre at Seton is being tested Because this church, and for some of us in this room, we have not lived through the generation, like the the greatest generation that was born between 1901 and mid-20s, 1920s, that lived through World War I, World War II, and the Great Depression, and that was forged in fire and had to develop character and had to develop resilience and had to build from very little to lay a platform for the next generations, like the baby boomers and Gen X and Gen Y, millennials, Gen Z, that we are, we have assumed prosperity. We have assumed peacefulness. We have assumed comfort. We have assumed economic growth. We have assumed a peaceful society and harmonious government. We have assumed things, we have placed our trust in things that are the fruit, that are not necessarily the reality. And some of us, our Christianity is being tested. For some of us, our sense of uh, just hope in the future is being tested. I have never led and pastored through a time like I am now. I've been a pastor for more than 15 years and I've never led in a time where there's so many people disoriented, distracted, discouraged and struggling all at the one time. In any church, there's people that are going through a health crisis, people that are going through a relationship crisis. But right now, I'm willing to bet that right now that a number of us are being tested about what do we really believe about who we are and what do we believe about God and His purposes for our world. Some of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century came up with some of the greatest writings of the 20th century because they asked some of the best questions of the 20th century. Um, A a theologian called Jürgen Moltmann, he was a German soldier that was arrested uh, during World War II and it was in a prison camp that a British um, guard shared with him a Bible and he basically, in this prison camp, as a Nazi soldier, had this crisis of saying, what is my life about? And his question that he spent the rest of his career, he just died, I think, last year, actually, this guy. Um, But he spent his whole career asking, where was God in the Holocaust? What kind of God would allow the evil of the Holocaust? Where is God? And is that God worthy of worship? And so he wrote a book about that. And it was called The Crucified God and a a book that was very important informative in my uh, development as a, as a young Christian actually. And, and, and because he was saying, hey, I don't wanna have any worldview that doesn't grapple with the real evil in our world. I don't wanna live in such a life with a facade or an appearance of, of, of truth and beauty and progress that doesn't deal with the real stuff. I was listening to a podcast this week um, by a, a professor in psychology at a university in Uh, the United States, and he pursued his doctoral studies in psychology because he was grappling with the question after September 11, what would possess people in this world of unrivaled progress, uh, unrivaled prosperity, what would possess young men to sacrifice their lives by flying planes into a building? 
killing people that they'd never met. And basically it affected him so deeply that he said, I wanna spend my life trying to understand the human person, trying to understand what would, what would force people to actually lay aside prosperity for a greater purpose, even if that purpose is evil. Maybe human beings are not just created for comfort and prosperity, maybe we are created for purpose. And when that purpose is misaligned, it can go awry. These questions shape us. Have you examined your faith? What do I believe? What do I believe about God? How many times have you said, well, isn't God meant to be da, da, da? I thought God was meant to be this. We have a lot of illusions in our thinking about God. This Psalm paints a radical picture about God, but it is not the God of 20, first century comfortable Christianity and it's not the and, and the picture of the human person that we read here is a different picture to the picture of the human person sometimes that we even present in the church how are you today yeah awesome praise God how are you going yeah couldn't be better have you ever been in church I probably should start my sermon soon have you ever been in church and someone says, how are you going? And the words that came out of your mouth were an absolute lie. And not because you just didn't wanna to talk to that person because you didn't trust that they would be confidential, but just because you didn't have the ability to be emotionally honest about how you're really going. Well, this Psalm has got some good news for you. It's an ancient Psalm, an ancient song that the, that the Jews would have read around the end of a meal during the eighth day of the Passover festival where they would remember God's deliverance of them from bondage, slavery and, ha and that God had mercy on them in the midst of His righteous anger towards evil. And aren't you thankful that God does have righteous anger towards the evil in our world? That one day there's gonna be a purging and a purification of this world where the devil and all of his filthy demons are gonna be thrown into a lake of fire. There's gonna be a cleansing, there's gonna be a renewal and there's gonna be a new heavens and there's gonna be a new earth and death will be dead forever. God has a righteous hatred and anger towards evil. And in this world, ancient world of evil, the ancient Children of Israel remembered God's deliverance from them and God's mercy towards them in the midst of this evil. It was this meal that Jews celebrate, not just back then, but to this day. And on the eighth day, while drinking a cup of celebratory wine, that they would often stand and they would read or sing this psalm. Isn't that cool? They would have psalms for the start of the meal they would have psalms for the middle of the meal and then they'd have psalms for the end of the meal. This is the end of the meal when they're really full and they're just topping it off with the celebratory vino. So what is the picture that we get in this psalm that is so radical? First of all, how are human beings, how are you and I depicted? The psalmist here, if you look in verse three and eight, has almost died. He is hysterical, unhinged. He is in a point of distress, anguish and sorrow and is calling out to God with no other ability other than desperation. The first thing I wanna say is Christians that, that have the, not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament. Isn't it amazing when we read about sorrow, anguish, desperation, we don't think about, wow, God could never empathise with this. We think immediately of Jesus Christ, the man of sorrows. We as Christians should be people that recognise that God meets us in our sorrow, God meets us in our anguish, and He has entered into that Himself. That is a place of meeting God. That is a place not of running from God, that is a place where we meet God because it is where He has met us. But he, the Psalmist has died. Now, 
Was he really close to death? Maybe. But, you know, human beings are allowed hyperbole from time to time. Oh, I'm dying. Oh, my goodness, I'm boiling. Oh, I mean, the, the way my kids carry on sometimes in the car, it's just... Oh, I'm starving. You literally ate 30 minutes ago. Oh, like that's, that's how my, my kids carry on. The psalmist has almost died. But not only physical pain and anguish and sorrow, but there's an emotional, psychological level of being unhinged to the point where he thinks everyone is lying to him. It says it here. Verse 11, in my alarm, I said, everyone's a liar. So the psalmist started becoming a conspiracy theorist. Hands up if you're a conspiracy, no, no. <laughs> the thing about conspiracy theorists is no one thinks that they are. And um, I mean, don't get, oh, look, I'm, I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole, but because a lot of dis- conspiracy theories do end up coming true and then they're not conspiracies anymore. No, I'm not gonna go there. But this person is, this person is distrusting everyone, blaming the finger at everyone. Have you been to a point in your life where it just seems like the world would be okay if it wasn't just for everyone else? You know, if I was to say, hey, you know, Alex or hey, Vanessa, tell us, tell us about the problems in your life. Where do I start? I mean, the parents and the, the, the partner and the, 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 the family and the kids and the, the, the work and it's like, and we become, and it's like, the problem is everything. We become exacerbated with everything. We become unhinged from reality. We, we lose the ability to see things as they really are. This person is having a crisis. I'm gonna delve into a gender stereotype right about now. Pray for me. I'm willing to bet that there's actually lots of people in this room that struggle to be honest when you're not doing okay. We have a day called Are You Okay Day. I have people that will text me on Are You Okay Day and they'll be like, Are you okay? And what do I do in return? Thumbs up emoji. But it's like, I just do I really want to go there on Are You Okay Day? I'm willing to bet generally a number of the, the women in this church, not all, and I don't want to overlook you, but are, are much better at communicating with other women in this church about how you're going. Not all. And if you are a woman in this church and you're quite isolated and no one knows how you're going, I'm really sorry that you haven't been able to communicate that with someone. You need to. And if you're a bloke and you're really good at communicating how you're going, particularly when you're not doing well, if you're really good at that, good luck. God God bless you, keep it up. But I think most men are like sinking islands in the Pacific. We're just like these little islands and it's like, how are you going over there? And the polar ice caps are melting and we're sinking. Yep, no worries, yep, never been better. And we're all sinking in silence. There's a picture I had for the men in our church at CFC South that we're like sinking islands. And God has made us to be family. He's made us to carry each other's burdens in words of Galatians out of reverence for Christ. God wants you to be honest about your emotions and how you're going. To be a Christian is not to be fake. The Psalmist here lays it out. He says, I as a man was falling apart. And when you're falling apart, you know what you don't need? You don't need karma. You don't need someone to say, hey, what goes around comes around. Yeah, it must suck to be in that situation. Yeah, you've made some really bad choices. You're gonna have to wait a few lifetimes until you start getting some good luck go your way. And people don't just need judgment in that moment. What do people need when they're in a pit of despair? They need someone from a solid rock to come down and rescue them. 
And so it is from that perspective that the psalmist says, I will call on Him as long as I live. Why in his despair does he say, I will call upon God? It's because of the picture of God in this psalm. Let's have a look in just from verse one. First of all, it says, I love the Lord for he heard my voice. Why do we love the Lord? Why, why does the psalmist say, oh, I will worship him as long as I live? First of all, he loves the Lord because the Lord first loved him. I love the Lord because he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy before we can do anything for God, before we can tick off any checklist, before we can show our works of righteousness, before we can turn our life around, God meets us with mercy. Have you ever imagined, recently I saw someone um, at the shops who um, didn't treat me that nicely years ago. And that person, in a worldly sense, deserved me to ignore them at the shops. And so when they went past me, they saw me and I saw them, but we kind of didn't acknowledge that we saw each other. You know that game that we play? And and, and, and then I said, I made a decision. If I see them again, I'm gonna go up to them. I'm gonna shake their hand. I'm gonna give them dignity. I'm gonna look at them in the eye. I'm gonna bless them. And when I inevitably walk past them again, because that's the way things go, because the awkwardness, you know, even if you try to avoid it, it sometimes ends up happening. I walked past that person and I went up to them and I greeted them and I looked at them in the eye and I blessed them and I could tell they were shocked. And they didn't know what to do. They they actually were, were fumbling for words because they were shocked with the way I was talking to them. I wasn't doing anything. I was giving them mercy where they probably thought, you know, Tim doesn't even wanna know me. Tim probably doesn't wanna be part of my life. Tim just thinks I'm irrelevant to his life, but no, no, I showed mercy. And when you're shown mercy, it's, it's a beautiful thing because you don't deserve it. That's what mercy is. You don't get what you deserve. You don't get avoidance. You don't get resentment. You don't get rejection. You get embrace. You get acknowledgement. You get dignity. I love the Lord for he heard my voice. It goes on to say, I will call on him as long as I live. Um, And it goes on to say, um, verse four, then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. You see in Exodus, when the law was given um, to God's people, um, in Exodus 34, it talks about the, uh, God's character is revealed and it says the Lord is gracious, slow to anger and, rich, and full of unfailing love, full of loving kindness. And it goes on to talk about God's anger and God's wrath and God's justice, but it starts with His mercy and His grace and His unfailing love. God's standard response to His children, no matter what you've done, no matter where you come from, is mercy, not giving you what you do deserve and grace, pouring love and kindness upon you when you don't deserve it. That's his starting point and it is amazing. And that is why this man was able to talk, call out to God. He knew the character of God. He knew the character of God. And my friends, if you have not sinned really badly, if you have not fallen short incredibly, if you have not realised that without God you are nothing, then you have not probably realised the riches of God's grace and mercy in your life. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, if you wanna know what a blessed and a prosperous life is, blessed are the spiritually bankrupt. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. It's not the people that say, God, tell me, let me tell you how much of an asset I'm gonna be in your kingdom. I'm an amazing public speaker. I'm an amazing business person. I'm an amazing people person. I just, uh, God, let me tell you, I'm gonna be a blessing. And, and I, oh man, that church is never gonna be the same after I go to that church. God just says, mate, that's not what it's about. If you wanna know what a blessed life is, it's someone that says, God, without you, I wouldn't even have life. God, I am a sinner. And I... I'm only now coming to terms with how at my core, more often than not, I will choose self over you, God. I will choose self over others. I'm so sorry. But simultaneously, when you're overwhelmed by your own sinfulness, 
it's like you're in this swimming pool of sin and guilt and being overwhelmed by how much you fall short, your brokenness. It's like there's times where it's like a mirror, every aspect of your life. How can you get your life together when there's so many things that are broken and wrong? But if that was like a swimming pool full of sin and full of brokenness, it's like that swimming pool is thrown into an ocean of God's grace and mercy. And somehow the swimming pool doesn't seem so big anymore because God's love and God's mercy swallows up and is bigger than our sin. Verse four, it says, then I called on the name of the Lord, Lord, save me. You know, there's a a word in the New Testament, a name in the New Testament for saviour. And it's the word Jesus. It's why Jesus was, um, you know, Jesus' parents were told to name him saviour. So wherever he went, when people called upon his name, people would be saved. Because God is not looking for righteous perfectionism before people can come to God. All he is looking for is people that will say, I need a saviour. And there's power in the name of Jesus. In a few moments, I'm gonna get you all to call out to Jesus. Seems like a weird thing, but as Christians, we should just get used to it. Being weird is our thing. I want you to call out to Jesus. Call out to your saviour. And thank you. Thank him that he has saved you. This is a radical picture of God that is different to every other polytheistic and um, monotheistic religion out there. This is a unique picture of who God is. Mercy, compassion, grace. There is something liberating about a God that meets you in your distress and transforms us in the midst of it, that brings us joy in the sorrow, that doesn't just try to separate us from pain, but transforms it. Kind of reminds me, there's something disarming about the mercy and grace of God. It reminds me of my grandmother. Often we talk about God as being like a a parent, but I think parenting is just too hard work for the analogy to work sometimes because parenting is a lot of fun, but it's a lot of hard work as well. I think the relationship that I'm looking forward to one day is being a grandparent. Eventually when my daughter you know, gets married at age 47 and um, then, no, <laughs> no, no, jokes. But my grandmother um, lived in a granny flat at the back of my house and uh, she was a big part of my life in my teenage years. I remember going through times of my teenage life like when I was an early teenager and praying to God, God, please may my grandmother not die until I, until I, I turn an adult. I remember feeling, I don't know if I can actually make it without her. That was, she's such a big part of my life. Isn't that weird for a teenager to pr- pray like that? But I remember praying that to God. Anyway, when I was, m- my parents and I got along really well in the younger years, but in the teenage years, I, I, I fought with them quite a bit. And there was times when I was irritating them and they were irritating me and it was just not peaceful in the home. Um, now, give me a show of hands if that... Ah, <laughs> oh, too close to home. But I remember at times I would retreat to my grandmother's house and it was my sanctuary. We'd go and watch, we would watch ER together and we would also watch The X-Files. She was the best grandmother. And, um, and so I could watch all the shows that I wasn't allowed to watch with my parents with her. And um, yeah... Um, and so, and, and I'd go in there, I'd get a can of drink, soft drink, I'd get chips. She'd like get me like an ottoman for my feet. And it was just like, it was just, she just pampered me. It was great. I wonder why I went there and she never told me off. And, but I remember there was times when I'd go in there and my parents would be, and I remember my parents saying, Tim can come in here, but he's not, um, you know, he's not eating rubbish. He's already eaten dinner. He's already had dessert, he's not eating rubbish and he's not to watch that show, da 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 And then, you know, and then, you know, my grandmother would say, come here, come here, love, yeah, yeah. And then she'd, she'd hug me and then, and then she'd be like, what's going on? And I'm like, oh, you know, mum, this, mum, dad, this, it's so unfair, they don't understand, they should be thankful that I'm not around the streets doing drugs like my, some of my other friends and they should be so lucky having a son like me. And then she's like, come here, now, now, hun, now honey, look, your parents are doing the best they can and mum's got a lot of pressure in. Look, you just need to be, all right, all right. You know, yeah, it's okay. And she's like, I'll have a talk to mum. And she's like, would you like a can of drink? 
You want some chips? <laughs> hey, I, I recorded that show. Do you want to watch? And, and so my mum would be like, what's happening? And my, and my grandmother, she had this inability not to show me kindness and mercy and grace. And her attitude was this. Hey, I'm the grandparent. I'll let the parents discipline. My job is to spoil rotten. And um, see, my daughter has a grandparent like that too. And um, <laughs> from time to time, like actually my um, youngest son, Jude, one day his grandfather was taking him to school and um, he was early and he, and, and he was told, you know, if, if you want to get a, some breakfast or like a, probably a hash brown or something before school, that's fine. You know, just we don't want to drop him to school half an hour early. And so um, uh, Jude's grandfather, also let's just call him Bill V, um, <laughs> Uh, dropped, uh, took Jude and, and said, all right, what do you want for breakfast? And, and my son, my seven-year-old son said, I would like a blue slushy from McDonald's for breakfast. And, um, and then this man, let's just call him uh, Bill V, um, said, are, are you allowed to have that for breakfast? And Jude said, yes, I am. Mum and dad said, yes. And so then uh, Bill bought him a slushy for breakfast. And <laughs> You see, God does discipline us and God, God hates sin and he does discipline us and there is that element to his relationship with us. But I think when you're in distress, when you're not okay, when you're struggling to come to terms with your place in the world, your starting point is this ridiculous, lavish, almost irresponsible mercy of a grandparent. Poured out upon a grandchild that just feels like, oh my gosh, this person would do anything for me. And in the midst of that, my grandmother would whisper to me and say, when I'd go home, hey, be a bit easy on your mum. And the funny thing is, it motivated me to be easier on my mum. Her mercy and her grace disarmed me when I was being combative. Salvation, my friends, is not about life modification from the outside in, but it's a new beginning from a hopeless state. If you don't realise you're hopeless without Jesus, then you probably haven't realised the beauty and the, the richness of grace to dive into if your hope is in Christianity, if your hope is in government, if your hope is in economic progress, if your hope is in government, if your hope is in your relationship, you will miss the joy of being lost in the mercy, the, the, the oceans of God's mercy that you are not deserving of. So how do we respond to this? I think the, the, the key scripture for response is in verse 13, uh, verse, uh, sorry, 12. What shall I return to the Lord for his goodness to me? So the, the, the start of the, this psalm has been all about, I was lost, I was desperate, I was struggling, but God's compassion, God in his mercy saved me. When I called out to him, he was listening to me. And then it's a time for thankfulness. How can I return to the Lord for his goodness in me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. It goes on to say that I will fulfill my vows and I will serve the Lord because he's broken my chains to serve him. You see, God does want you to serve him, my friends. He does want you to minister for him. He does want you to do things for him, but he wants it to come out of a rest knowing that you are loved and that you are treasured and you are his. That's the platform. Service that flows from celebration. Imitation, following God, that flows from intimacy, not the other way around. What shall I return to the Lord for His goodness in me? I was watching, when I was reading this, I'm like, where have I heard this? Where have I heard this? And then um, I found a 2001 YouTube, uh, uh, 2001 U2 live in Boston, part of the Elevation Tour, when the band U2 was transitioning from a song they used to do called 40, which is based on Psalm 40, transitioning from that into the epic where the streets have no name, that entrance. And it's like the lights go down, 
people have got their hands raised, like almost like in this state of worship. And um, he's singing out, how long will we sing this song? Which is like a cry from the heart. God, when are you gonna bring peace to this world? And then he starts reading over, over and over again, what shall I return to the Lord for his goodness or the blessings that he's poured into my life? And he just repeats it over and over again. And it is powerful. And then the lights come on and they lift their hands and it's like, I feel like everyone's worshipping. They don't know who they're worshipping, but they're, they're tapping into that primitive desire to call out to God something beyond themselves. In the message, this is what Bono actually recites in this concert. What can I give back to God for the blessings He's poured out on me? What can I give back to God for the blessings He's poured out on me? I'll lift high the cup of salvation, a toast to God. You notice the, the picture here. What can we give back to God for what He's given to us in saving us, in redeeming us, in rescuing us, in pouring love and kindness and compassion into our lives? He wants us to drink a cup of celebration with him. The Jews would have been reading this psalm during a festival while they're drinking wine. Before we do anything, he wants us to celebrate the finished work of what he's already done. In this context, what are they finish? What are they celebrating? The finished work of the Passover, where the blood on the doorstop protected them, the sacrifice of an animal covered for their sin and almost like made atonement for their sins so that they received mercy. But we as Christians, when we lift up a cup around communion table, we acknowledge, we thank God, we can drink from this cup because you gave your life for us. We can drink from this cup of celebration because you drank from the cup of wrath for our sin. And now we can stand here free. Ultimately, guys, how do you really know if you have if you, if you really have a healthy understanding of who you are as a person, who God is, how thankful you are. But that shows how humble you are, but it also shows how much of a revelation you have of the wonder and the beauty of God. Guys, God wants to overwhelm you by letting you realise how small you are in the cosmos. How, in one sense, insignificant you are, but simultaneously, how wondrously made you are in His image. And how even though, like this, this narrative that the world tells you that you're the most important person in the world and it's all about us. No, no, we're tiny. But God says we have value and dignity and He unites us with Him. And there's, in the mysteries of the universe, God cares about you. Wow. Can I have um, the band up? It finishes by saying this. Precious, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. Has God freed you from your chains? I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. And the name of the Lord is Jesus. I think now would be a really good time for us to thank the Lord. What shall I return to the Lord for his goodness to me? I think we should thank the Lord right now. I think we should call out to the name of Jesus. Will you stand to your feet? Please join with me as we pray. My first question is this. Um, like everyone to close their eyes, even people on stage, you can close your eyes as well. My first point was this Psalm. It's a Psalm of the, our great and compassionate God. But some of us are being shielded from receiving and enjoying his mercy, receiving and enjoying His forgiveness, receiving and enjoying His grace because we are not honest about the fact that we have been trying to save ourselves. We have been trying in our own strength to live our own way and we are not okay. We are sinking. We are lonely. We are isolated. We are fractured. 
we are, there is a disconnect in our life. We are sad all the time. We are distressed. We are conflicted. And we come and we sing songs in church. We are fearful. And there's a disconnect between the faith that we sing about and the reality of our lives. And I think that this morning, God wants you to realise that the blockage is not because of His character and not because of His goodness and not because of His love, but it's just, it starts with the humility to say, I'm not doing that well and I need a Saviour. You might even be a Christian already, (laughs) but you need a Saviour. You need God to save you from the predicament that you're in. God, who is rich in mercy, full of unfailing love. If you're here today, I'm not gonna call you out the front for a counselling appointment or anything like that. This is between you and God. And it's up to you, whether you talk to a counsellor, whether you talk to a trusted ministry leader or someone like that. But God is compassionate. God has more compassion in His little finger than you do in your whole body. And He wants to meet you in your sorrow, in your distress, will you? Just say, and like literally, I'm a guest preacher. I'm not gonna be able to follow you up next week. It's between you and Jesus. Just, if you wanna put your hand up and say, I'm not doing that well, I'm not doing okay. Just put your hand up and say, Jesus, I'm being honest with you. Yep. Thank You, Lord. I might just lead you all in a prayer just as a time of response because a number of you did put your hands up and I think it'd be great if we could all pray out together. Father God, I thank You that You meet me in the place that I'm in. I thank You that Your Son Jesus was a man of sorrow and He knows what I'm going through right now. I thank You that You meet me, that You nurture me, that You change me, and that You lead me from where I am. I need a Saviour. And I thank You that this road ahead has been paved through the life and death of Your Son, Jesus. So I don't have to do it in my own strength that You have made a way. Help me to be honest when I'm not okay. Help me to be honest when I struggle. Give me Your wisdom to navigate this season of my life. Holy Spirit, fill my life. Fill me with Your joy. Fill me with Your peace and give me courage to make that next step. In Jesus' Name.